So I'm going to talk to you guys about some um, options for treating pests in residential settings uh, as if you are using some commercial products. And not sure how many of you guys are having to treat pests on fruit trees, but I know it can be a challenge when you're doing one tree here and there and trying to keep up with uh, the right timing for some of these issues. So first I wanted to let you know about some resources that are available to you. So this is the website for integrated pest management. And um, there's a link uh, for fruit IPM. I'm, I'm not sure if you can see an arrow on my screen or not. Maybe, Megan, you can tell me if that's a yes. Um, if you click here, you can access our weekly newsletters or or periodic newsletters. And those newsletters include information on current pest activity, um, what to treat and when. And this one was sent out on February 20 or April 26th. And we already have some information on uh, when to treat in certain areas for codly moth. So it's just a PDF uh, document, so you can sign up on the website for that. Yes, Marion, we can see your arrow. OK, great. Thank you. And we also have a commercial tree fruit production guide. Um, this is for agricultural producers, but it might be useful to you guys. Um, there's some spray tables here in Chapter 6, and also some pest biology information. So that guide, you can get it from this website, intermountainfruit.org. Um, there's the link to it right here. And basically, this guide is just a companion version, or this website's companion version of this guide. And you can also buy a copy, too, if you would like. So those two things you might find useful to you if you have to deal with fruit pests. All right, so I wanted to talk about um, a couple of pests, and I broke it out by crop. So we'll start with apple pear and just three options here, fire blight, codling moth, and San Jose scale. OK, so fire blight um, can be a problem on certain apple varieties. Uh, those of you that deal with ornamental trees, I'm sure you're familiar with fire blight on hawthorn or ornamental pears. Um, but it's also a problem on certain apple varieties that are, can be highly susceptible. And these varieties are the ones that are the most common because they're, um, they taste good, um, and that's what the consumer demands and even the homeowner likes, like the Fuji, Gala, um, Honeycrisp, et cetera. So fire blight's caused by a bacterium, and it's spread by wind-driven rain, um, or even bees can spread it from flower to flower. So it only causes new infections on open flowers. And so these um, infections shown on the left is on pear, on the right is apple. And the pear, you can see it's black in color, so that's where the fire blight gets its name. And both of these are associated with these flower clusters. So some varieties that are not as susceptible, like Red Delicious, it will, um, the fire blight infection will end just at the flower cluster. But on those more susceptible varieties, the fire blight will extend to the terminal shoot and will cause this characteristic shepherd's crook uh, symptom. But the fire blight can also continue growing through the phloem towards the trunk. And that's where it can get to be a real problem, killing these large scaffold limbs um, and even killing the, uh, the main, the tree itself. So this is an area underneath the bark scraped away, showing the dead tissue killed by the bacteria. All right, so dealing with fire blight, um, there's a couple of options. And really, it's kind of a multi-pronged approach. Uh, the first is to use copper spray during bud break, or right when those buds start to open. It shouldn't be applied really any later than that, because it could cause some injury to the fruit. But what the copper will do will help the bacteria to stop reproducing so quickly. But then the next option is to use antibiotics during bloom. And that's going to help prevent 
uh, these new infections from happening. And there's, there's just two options, streptomycin and oxytetracycline. And again, those are only used during bloom. And to know when treatment or when infection might happen, it's going to be when there's been a period of about four days when temperatures are above 75 degrees. And then for, because it's a bacteria, it needs moisture to cause an infection. So those types of, of uh, environmental conditions would be perfect for an infection. But after bloom, uh, antibiotics should not be used. And so if, that, if that's the case, if any infections are found, then the only option is really just to prune them out. And if they're caught early, and again, this is something that uh, if you have clients you know, all over a large area, you're not going to be able to, to catch them at this time. But um, if they're caught early and you can visualize where the, uh, the symptoms or the damaged tissue is, the amount to remove is just going to be about twice that visual um, symptom that you see. But if you catch um, symptoms where you have a, a large um, branch dying or a, a twig dying, it's better to take out a lot more because the bacteria grows beyond what you can see visually. So you would just look at the end um, where the edge of the symptom is and prune about 8 to 12 inches beyond that. And if you guys are pruning fruit trees in the wintertime, you may have noticed some apple trees or pear trees have um, twigs with leaves still attached. So that's a sure sign that that was a fire blight infection. And so those um, would need to be removed in the regular pruning practices. And when, um, when fire blight gets to be really bad, you may end up with the ugly tree uh, syndrome, or this tree was stub cut, but it really uh, was just too far gone, and you know, tree may need, may need to be removed altogether. OK, so codling moth. That is the primary insect pest of apples and pears. And it's, it's what people refer to as the worm and the fruit. So it's really a, a larva or a caterpillar of a moth. And uh, what it prefers to feed on are the seeds um, of the apple. So it always will just tunnel right through the flesh and into the seeds. And it's such a um, successful pest that any tree, almost anywhere in Utah, that's not treated may potentially have about 100% of the fruit infested. So any fruit that's infested um, as the larvae feed on the inside, they'll push out their poop. And that poop is called frass. And so it looks kind of like sawdust there on the outside of the fruit. That's how you can easily tell fruits that are infested. So managing pests of uh, any trees, it's good to know the biology. So you know when they're active, you know when, when's the right time to, to treat them. So codling moth, it spends the winter as a larva. And then in spring, uh, as soon as the temperatures start to warm, the larva pupates to an adult moth. And those, the moths start emerging around bloom of apple. So we've already, we have some traps set up. We've already caught some codling moths. So they mate, and they lay eggs on the fruit, and then the larvae uh, bore right into the fruit, like I said, feeding on the seeds. So around uh, mid to late June, those larvae will mature, and then they will drop out of the fruit, pupate, and a second generation of moths will emerge. So the other thing about codling moth is it's pretty much around and laying eggs all season long. So to really get a clean crop of fruit, um, it's best to time your pesticide applications to when the moths are laying eggs or when those eggs are hatching, and also to reduce pesticide usage. So in those advisories that I mentioned at the beginning, we'll, we do provide dates of beginning and end of each generation. And these products listed here um, are some options. Now, this webinar, as you heard, is available on, on the forestry website. So you can always go back and get this information from there. But so there's about five or so conventional options I've listed here, and then a, an organic option. And again, all these are uh, commercial type products that can be used in residential settings. And the one listed there, Delegate, 
right above 7 is probably the best option for codling moth. It lasts about 21 days, so it's the longer time span, and it really does work fairly well. The second column to the last, it says PHI, that stands for pre-harvest interval. So that's the period of time from which the last application is made to harvest. So if you apply that Asana, one has to wait 21 days for apple and 28 days for pear before the fruit can be eaten. So that's what that column means. OK, San Jose scale. Um, there's so many different scale species. I know you all are familiar with uh, armor, armored and soft scales. This is a, an armored scale, but it can feed on the twigs and branches, but also it can feed on the fruit as well. Um, feeding on the branches can cause the tree to kind of um, lose vigor, and of course the fruit injury makes the um, fruit inedible and unmarketable. So the San Jose scale is pretty prolific. Can lay, females can lay about 200 eggs um, each generation, and those eggs are active around mid-June, and then the, like I said, there's second generation towards the end of the summer. So a single scale on a fruit or on a twig just looks like a little pimple. Um, but the key characteristic is that they have this white center and a purple halo around the edge. And that's the same as on a twig as well. So this will be a pretty light infestation. Um, if you're pruning an orchard, um, a f apple tree, it may not be so easy to detect, but it's certainly something you'd want to look for when doing your pruning practices. So to deal with San Jose scale, like I said, it's an armored scale, um, and applying oil, dormant oil, um, right around bud break, it will take care of a few scales, but their body uh, is so um, impenetrable that it's not going to take care of all of them. And so that's why a second treatment targeting the crawlers is necessary. And again, this is something else that we can provide dates on the optimal treatment time. So oil, 1% oil or insecticidal soap are two options for the scale, um, but they might require two applications, so I don't know how, um, if that would be feasible if you're treating for a client, but esteem, that last option listed there, is excellent. It's an insect growth regulator, um, and used with oil, just one application would be all that's necessary. And uh, for San Jose scale, if the tree is really infested, it would require at least two years of this cycle of treatment. OK, so we'll switch gears to stone fruit pests. And by stone fruit, I just mean peaches, nectarines, apricots, cherries. So we'll start with corinium blight. This is a fungal cause disease, and it's also known as shot hole, because as it injures the foliage, the injured area drops out, so it looks like it's been shot up. Um, but on fruit, it causes these scabby, corky lesions. Um, it's particularly active in spring and fall. That's, those are the two primary times when new infections happen. So on fruit, um, infections look on peaches, on the left, this is a, a early season infection where um, there's the purple halo. It kind of looks like the San Jose scale, um, but it really will be obvious because you'll see some infections on foliage as well. Uh, but it's also associated with some gumming or oozing on those new fruits. And then on the right is a late season infection showing that those brown lesions that are kind of sunken in. That just means that um, there's probably a rain event or something that happened um, and the fruit, um, maturing fruit, was a lot more susceptible. So dealing with corinium blight, um, there's two different times. I mentioned it's active mostly in spring and fall. So in the fall, when about 50% of those leaves have dropped, that's a great time to apply copper. 
And if you can't get out to all the sites you know, at the right timing, um, anywhere between 25 to 75% leaf drop will work. But the idea is to get that copper on the leaf scars, because that's where the new infections happen. So getting good coverage is important. And then in the spring, um, a fungicide can be applied to prevent infections happening on the new fruitlets. And so the best time for that is called shuck split. And that's when that brown papery covering splits off the brand new fruitlet. And it's at that time when the fruit's really susceptible. So fungicide applications um, include chlorothalonil, which works excellent, pristine, or captan. And captan is not quite as effective. Um, pristine could be used later in the season as well, but chlorothalonil can only be used up to that shuck split stage. All right, peach twig borer. So this is a pest of peaches, um, nectarines, and apricots primarily. And it causes these um, shoots, wilted shoot tips. And it also is the, quote, worm in the peach, like the worm in the apple. So um, the larvae of peach twig borer overwinters in the peach tree in a protected area. And then in the spring, when the new foliage comes out, the larva becomes active, starts feeding on the foliage, and then when the shoots expand, it will bore into those shoot tips. And those wilted shoots are sometimes not very easy to see because it's just maybe one or two leaves at the very tip of that shoot that wilt over. Um, but the larvae then it pupates to an adult moth around mid-May, towards the end of May. And then, then the moth lays eggs um, either on the fruit, if the fruit has matured, is nice and soft, or it lays eggs on the shoots if they're still nice and tender, because it does prefer to feed in the shoots. But late in, later in the season, those are all hardened off, so it's definitely targeting the um, ripening peaches. And I wanted to say back to peach twig borer, uh, with codling moth, I mentioned, you know, it's all throughout Utah, but peach twig borer is more of a kind of a localized pest. Some areas, people don't talk about it at all, and other areas, they really have to deal with it. So it's kind of a site-by-site -site basis. Uh, but dealing with twig borer, um, oil at the delay dormant timing does help for this pest because, again, those larvae are overwintering in the tree, and so it will help to suffocate some of those larvae in the tree. But also um, applying an insecticide at the timing when egg hatch begins um, is also required, again, on those high population sites. And again, this is another one where we can give exact dates on, on when treats, treatments should be made. So the, the options shown on this slide, are you'll notice they're very similar to the ones I showed for coddling moth. And so that's the nice thing about like delegate, for example. You can use it for a lot of different pests on different crops. So same um, time period, it lasts about 21 days. And the delegate, that one has a pre-harvest interval of one day. So it's very, it's safer on the uh, beneficials. Uh, as opposed to something like seven, it's a little bit more harmful. OK, greater peach tree borer. I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. I forgot to keep track. But we just have two more um, pests here to go through. So this is um, when you see some oozing down at the base of the tree. It's a clear wing moth, kind of looks like a wasp with that black and um, yellow striping. Uh, but it's a pest of peaches, apricots, and primarily. And then plums um, are rarely, if ever, attacked. But young trees, it's a threat to young trees. Um, they can be killed by greater peach tree borer. And older trees um, would need many, many years of multiple attacks to be killed, but it can uh, predispose them to other problems. OK, so they spend the winter as larvae in the crown of the tree or in the roots. And then in the spring, they'll, they'll start feeding again um, once the sap starts flowing. And around um, 
July 4th or late June, they pupate to an adult. And that, what you see there in the top right is the pupil skin left behind. And on the lower left is the male on the left and the female on the right. So after they mate, then the female lays eggs on uh, the trunks of the tree. And again, it's the lower, they lay eggs as low as they can. Any exposed roots, um, never really higher than 12 inches from the ground. And the symptoms are pretty, for the most part, pretty obvious with this ooze coming out from the base of the tree. A lot of time that ooze will be mixed with frass as well. So it kind of looks crumbly. Um, but poking around in there, some people have found larvae kind of mixed in with the ooze. And that's the tree flushing out the larvae and doing uh, healthy trees are able to flush them out. But if you see ooze higher up in the tree, that's not greater peach tree borer. That's definitely something else going on. So the symptoms are, are pretty characteristic. So dealing with this pest, um, trying to prevent injury to the bark is going to help. And so tree wrap over the winter to help prevent sun scald is an option, or painting those tree trunks with uh, a mixture of latex paint and water. But um, if the pest is a problem, um, if some trees have died or, or it's known to be present in the area, then insecticides are um, somewhat of a requirement. There's really no other, not many other options. But only the lower uh, two feet or so of the trunk and the exposed roots needs to be treated. And the best option is that first one there, permethrin. It has about 21 day um, lifetime or maybe even a month. So uh, two, maybe three treatments would, be, um, would take care of this pest. OK, the last one is cherry, Western cherry fruit fly. So every crop has a worm in the fruit. And this is the, um, this, in this case, it's a maggot in the cherry. Um, the issue with western cherry fruit fly is that when backyard trees are planted or grown near commercial orchards, so if those trees um, aren't managed very well, that serves as a population source or site of infestation of the flies into the commercial orchard. And if the orchard has a crop that's infested, then you know it's their livelihood. Um, their crop may be rejected by a packing plant. So it is important for people who own cherry trees to make sure that they are managed, at least for this pest. So cherry fruit fly spends the winter um, as a pupa in the soil. So again, dormant sprays will not do anything for this pest at all because they're under the soil. Um, but they emerge around mid-May towards late May. And they're able to lay their, their eggs right under the skin of the fruit. It's not on the surface of the fruit. And they're active all through harvest and even into October. But they cannot lay eggs in the fruit until the fruit has, the skin has softened up enough. So once the skin has developed a kind of a rosy pink blush, they're shown on the right um, on top of the yellow, that's when the fruits are susceptible and that's when uh, the tree should be, treatments should be begin on the tree. On the left there, those green fruits, so they're, they're green, the uh, Adult fly cannot penetrate the fruit, so any spray applied to a tree with green fruit would be a wasted spray. And here again, we see delegate, that third one down. So that one's also good for a cherry fruit fly. Um, this idea of protecting fruit from ro the rosy blush, that's across the board. Um, so we don't really need to provide a date for that in our advisories. but. Um, if you have any clients that have cherry trees uh, that you that aren't managed and you find out about that, you could maybe um, convince them to replace it with something else, especially, again, if this is in an area close to um, someone who's growing, wants to harvest their fruit for, for market. OK, so um, with this particular pest, there are a few more organic options, but it's I can see it would be difficult to manage trees organically um, in your, biz your line of work, because you would have to visit the tree almost every week to take care of this pest. 
Um, but those are a couple of options. So that is uh, the end. There's my contact information. I encourage you to write that down, and you can feel free, if you have any questions at all about managing fruit trees, you can just shoot me an email or, or give me a call. So Megan, that's the end. Great. Thanks, Marion. That was very informative. Um, Brett had a quick question. Can you tell us a little bit about the Home or Orchard Pest Management yes. Guide? So that is um, targeted towards homeowners. It's available on that IPM website I showed you at the beginning. Um, and it's last time it was updated, I think, was 2012. So we need to do a new update. But it's a more simplified version of the commercial guide. And it's available as a PDF or web pages. Great. OK, well, um, thank you very much for your presentation. And I'll let you mute yourself. And I will introduce Brent now. So this is just a reminder for those of you that entered the webinar late. My co-host, Heather Church, will be collecting CEU numbers throughout the presentation. If this pertains to you, please hover over her name and start a private chat with her, or just type in your information in the chat pod in the bottom left corner. She'll take your information and make sure you receive credit. And if you'll just bear with me for a minute, I will pull up the next presenter. And Brett, it looks like the same thing happened. We're at the very end of your presentation. So unfortunately, I'm just going to scroll to the beginning really fast. Sorry about that. So our next speaker is Brent Black. Brent is a professor in the Plants, Soils, and Climate Department here at Utah State University. He's also a statewide extension fruit specialist. Brent works primarily with commercial tree fruit production and berry producers. He has been at USU since 2005, and he was previously a research scientist with the USDA Fruit Laboratory in Beltsville, Maryland. Thanks a lot, Brent, for volunteering to give us a presentation today, and I look forward to your talk. Thanks, Megan. Uh, I, as Marion was talking, I thought of a few things that I wanted to mention. Uh, one was that home orchard pest management guide, which Marion brought up at the end. The other is that uh, we also have a fruit website. Uh, I've typed the URL there in the chat box. It's just fruit.usu.edu. Some of the more horticultural fact sheets, less to do with pest management, are posted on that website. So I'd encourage you to take a look there. And, uh, and that will cover some of the topics that I'm not going to be talking about today. So as I visited with Megan about this and, and what kind of things I might present in 20 or 25 minutes that might be useful, uh, I picked a few topics that I want to kind of focus on that are I think are important for um, updating. Uh, so first of all, I want to talk about root stocks um, and then a little bit about training and pruning and how how specifically pruning differs with fruit trees than it does, say, for shade trees or, or others that, that you're more uh, familiar with. Uh, long, for a long time, we've had basically dwarfing or semi-dwarfing trees, particularly with apples. So oftentimes, the, the nursery catalogs will talk about a semi-dwarf or a dwarf tree. And the, the Basis for this is the fact that in apples we use clonal rootstocks. So historically, uh, fruit trees as well as shade trees are grafted, and historically they were grafted on seedling rootstocks. So you'd take seeds from a lot of apples, plant them out, and graft onto those. And in the 50s and 60s, uh, the, the industry shifted to using uh, clonal rootstocks, where instead of just a seedling, any random seedling, we're using basically a separate variety as the root. And so that's the basis for, for dwarfing and semi-dwarfing. This is a, a diagram that comes from a, uh, 
a nursery catalog that just shows uh, kind of the different characteristics. And I'm trying to move the pointer, and it doesn't want to move for me. So I guess I'm. Uh, but the the M, they're, they're, many of them came from the Malling, East Malling Research Station in England. So they're usually a M or Malling, and then a number. Uh, you can see on the right, M106 and M111 are considered semi-dwarfing. They're a little bit smaller than a standard seedling. Uh, M7 there in the middle is also considered a semi-dwarf. M26 and M9 on the left are the are the true dwarfing rootstocks. So we've we've had this uh, concept of being able to control the size of the tree based on the rootstock, and oftentimes. In the nursery trade and, and garden trade, they don't go beyond just saying semi-dwarf or dwarf. But each of these is a, is a unique variety and has some unique characteristics. And that's one of the reasons that I want to talk about this um, just a little bit before we, uh, as part of this update. So one of the other characteristics that comes into play besides size control is this concept of precocity. So a precocious rootstock means that it starts to produce fruit when the tree is much younger, uh, and uh, that was a, a major advantage for some of these clonal rootstocks. Uh, M7 and M106 are, tend to be less precocious, and as we get to the more dwarfing, they become more precocious, meaning they want to start to flower and fruit when the trees are quite young. Now that has some advantages, but it also has some disadvantages. Uh, one of the disadvantages is that these trees that are highly dwarfing and also highly precocious want to put it, produce a lot of fruit on a very small tree, which means either they need to be supported or they're going to break off. And in the commercial uh, fruit production industry, they use a lot of these very dwarfing, very precocious rootstocks. This is a typical commercial planting. Uh, these are, I believe, M9, so one of the very dwarfing uh, rootstocks. And you can see that these trees are probably only about two years old. And look at all the fruit that's hanging on them. Without that trellis, and you can see the, the trellis post there in the middle. And you, if you look closely, there's basically five wires that run. And that tree is attached to, those, to that trellis at five different points to support the tree when it has all that fruit on it at a, at a very young age. So the, the, the take home message there is these dwarfing rootstocks may not be appropriate for a home garden situation because of their need for support. Uh, if they're not supported, they're going to set that fruit and break off. So typically what is recommended for home garden situations is something M7 or larger because they they're have a little bit more strength in the graft union and they're not quite as precocious. They're not going to try and fruit when they're so so young. So those are some of the, the characteristics. Now, if, the, if they're interested in an espalier where they're going to spread it out on a trellis, these, these larger non-precocious rootstocks are not going to work, and they're going to want those dwarfing ones. Another characteristic that comes into play besides that is disease resistance or pest resistance. Uh, Marion talked about fire blight and, and some of the challenges with fire blight. That's a major, major pest for us in both apples and pears. Uh, and one of, the, one of the unfortunate things is that many of these mauling rootstocks, including M26 and M9, are extremely susceptible to fire blight. And when you combine a susceptible rootstock and a susceptible cyan variety, you get not only the, the type of dieback that Marion was showing, but oftentimes, particularly with, say, M26, you can get a systemic infection. The bacteria will actually move uh, asymptomatically through the tree, get into the roots, and kill the tree from the bottom up. And so one of the really neat uh, developments that's come into play in the last, uh, say, decade is the introduction of Geneva rootstock. So if you look back at this diagram, that middle tree is M7 or Geneva 30, or G30 for short. These were bred and developed by Cornell University uh, and the US Department of Agriculture in Geneva, New York, and, and hence the name. So if possible, we're trying to recommend. These, these are fairly new in the nursery trade. They're under a lot of demand by the commercial growers, so it's hard. A lot of them aren't making it into the homeowner a garden center trade yet, but we'd really like to see that happen because of the, the problems that we see with fire blight. So 
if you're making recommendations as far as tree selection, uh, try and see if you can track down some of these Geneva rootstocks. Uh, they, they are both resistant to fire blight as well as some of them are resistant to woolly apple aphid, which is another pest that we do see in Utah. Uh, Marion didn't talk about it. It's not as, as significant as the ones she did talk about. Another one is, is bud nine. Bud is short for Budagovsky. It was uh, rootstock developed in Russia. And those are also fire blight resistant, but bud nine is also highly precocious and highly dwarfing, so it's not going to be uh, appropriate for a freestanding tree in someone's yard. More likely to be something that they could put on an espalier or somehow support otherwise. So those are some characteristics of apple root stalks to be looking at. Uh, the disease resistance becomes important. Uh, moving on to, yes. Hey Brent, if you want, Brent, let me inter interrupt you. If you want that pointer, um, just go to the top of your screen, yeah. and I believe if you click yeah, on the it's pointer activated, next to the but drop I, but my button, mouse can't move it'll it for activate some it reason. for I've you. Tried dragging if it. not, just ignore um, me, but so I think that might be a trick. Pear root stocks, there are size controlling pear root stocks. Oh, uh, many okay. of them right. are cross, what, what they call an old home by Farmingdale cross, and there's a whole bunch of numbered ones. This shows some of them, uh, and there's a lot of them out there. Uh, and interspecific uh, grafts like shown there on the, on the extremes. The problem with those is we don't get any fire blight resistance and pear, fire blight and pear is one of the reasons I don't typically recommend pear for a home orchard because it's just too hard to stay ahead of the, of the fire blight. Here's some of the more common ones, just showing the range of size. But the other, the other problem with these rootstocks that's a little bit disappointing is that none are particularly precocious. We don't see any that really stimulate early production that would make them, give them any benefit over anything else. And so they they're, have what's called low yield efficiency. A lot of the energy of the tree goes into producing wood instead of fruit. And that's what yield efficiency refers to. So I'm, I'm not really excited about any of the pear root stocks or pears in general for our climate because of the fire blight pressure. Cherry root stocks, there's some interesting developments. Historically, sweet cherries uh, primarily are propagated on mazard root stock. That's a, a variety of, of the sweet cherry species. And that's really the industry standard for sweet cherries. For the tart cherries or sour cherries, they use more of the uh, Prunus mahalub as a rootstock. It's a little bit smaller than mazard. It likes sandy soils. It's well adapted to our climate. Uh, there's other rootstocks that have been tried over the years. Colt rootstock is one that was very popular for a while. Uh, but it's not much smaller or more precocious than mazard, so that's kind of fallen out of favor. But some of the new ones that, that I'm really excited about are the Gisela rootstocks, which are from Germany. We've tried a number of these in Utah, and they've, they've been fairly well adapted. Uh, Gisela 6 is similar in size to Mazard, but it's much more precocious. It's going to produce a lot more fruit earlier on in the, in the life of the tree. But since cherries are small and apples are big, it's not got the same problem of, of breaking the tree off when it's young. Um, if for a home garden situation, a, a cherry tree, a sweet cherry tree can be very large. And I really like the, the idea of these smaller rootstocks like Gisela 5. We, we've tried extensively, and it's, it's available fairly extensively in the nursery trade. It's ha at least half the size of the mazard and very precocious, produces a lot of fruit. Uh, I think it's just a, a better choice for a home garden situation. Uh, Gisela 12, we haven't had a lot of experience. We do have some of those planted at our research farm and just starting to get a look. Gisela 3 also looks very good, but it's not as widely available as 6 or, or 5. So those some some things to look at in terms of, of cherry recommendations. Uh, here's just to show you, this is some pictures that my colleague shared with me to show you kind of the difference. These are both Bing sweet cherry on one's on Mazard, one's on Gisela Five, and you can see the dramatic difference in size. Um, so that is a really interesting development that I think 
needs uh, further attention for the home garden trade. Peach root stocks size control isn't so much important because we can keep peach trees smaller with appropriate um, training and pruning. <clears throat> but one of the issues that I'm excited about regarding peach root stocks is um, alkaline soil tolerance. We have a lot of problems in our alkaline soils with iron chlorosis in peaches. They tend to be very uh, susceptible. Um, and here's, here's an experimental planting in southern Utah County. You can see the, the middle tree there looks pretty good, and the one on the left that's almost cropped out of the picture and the one on the right are both very, very chlorotic. Those three trees were planted on the same day. They're the same age, um, and they're on three different rootstocks. And you can see there's some fairly dramatic differences. They've all been fertilized the same. We, we withheld iron chelate. Uh, well, we put a little bit on just to keep some of the trees alive, but we didn't put it on at, a, at what's typically a commercial rate. We put about a quarter on of what's normally put on. So you can see the dramatic difference there in, in root stocks. So the, the industry standard root stocks for peach are Lovell is probably the most common uh, root stock. Bailey is another one and Nemagard, those are the three that we see a lot of in the, in the nursery trade. Uh, as it turns out, when we look at iron uh, chlorosis susceptibility or efficiency of iron uptake, you might look at it that way, in our soils, Lovell is the worst, and that's unfortunately the most common. So if you look at that picture, there's three trees right there in the middle that are just about to die of iron chlorosis. Those are all Lovell. And, and the rest of the row are some other rootstocks that we're looking at. So you can see that there's uh, some problems there. So on our alkaline soils, some of the ones that we've, the, the one that's looked the best so far is one called Cataman. It's a rootstock that was developed in Europe. They use it a lot in Spain where they have similar soil conditions to us. And it, it's done very, very well wherever we've looked at it. These others, Nichols, Monegro, Bright's Hybrid 5, uh, Atlas and Viking, we have preliminary results that make those look very promising. Those at the bottom were some of the worst next to level in terms of survival and, and iron chlorosis susceptibility. So I think this could be really important in the nursery trade to, to start paying attention to peach root stocks and selecting root stocks that are adapted to our uh, alkaline soils that we see in a lot of, a lot of the areas of the state. Uh, some few few things about training and pruning and how they differ from uh, from in fruit trees from say shade trees uh, and just come kind of some of the guiding principles that I'm going to go over in order. So these are the kind of the things that I'm going to touch on. So if we leave a fruit tree, let's just say an apple tree for example, we leave it to its own devices and it it wants to make a shade tree out of itself if we let it. Uh, what we're going to end up is something like this. We're going to end up with fairly limited penetration of the light through the canopy. And if we look at the leaves on that tree, about a third of the leaves are going to be in full sun or say 60 to 100% of full sun. So the third of the leaves that are on the outer part of the canopy will be getting more than 60% of full sun. And as we move in, another third are going to get 30 to 60% and the last third is going to get less than 30% of full sun. So why is that important? Well, the reason that becomes important is that fruit growth and flower bud development is influenced locally. So if we have leaves that are highly shaded, like here in the lower part of the canopy, those are the leaves that are responsible for the development of the fruit on those same branches. And what happens if we get less than 30% of full sun is we get a lack of proper fruit development, particularly color and flavor. The, the, the sugars in the, in the fruit come from photosynthesis, and if we're not getting photosynthesis on the leaves immediately adjacent to that fruit, then there's not going to be sufficient uh, sugar accumulation, and there's not going to be a, uh, adequate color development. So that is one issue that becomes very important in trying to prune and train the tree to get light penetration to the middle of the tree. The other component that comes into play is flower bud formation. When those leaves are highly shaded, the buds that are forming on the wood in that part of the tree will not be flower buds. You will get some vegetative buds, but you will not get flower buds. So over time, 
you get fewer and fewer and fewer fruits produced in that center part of the tree and more and more produced uh, on the outside edge of, of the canopy, which means that a major portion of the, the uh, canopy is basically wasted space. So that is the, the, uh, the issue that comes into play. So a lot of what we do in terms of pruning and training is to get the light into the middle of the tree so that we can get continued flowering and fruiting and that the fruits that develop there will have sufficient sunlight to get, uh, to, to get full development. So pruning, uh, same problems that you deal with in a shade tree. We're looking at crotch angles, narrow crotch angles. You get uh, wood inclusion. You get weak connections. If the branches are rubbing or if the fruit is hanging and rubbing on a branch, that's a, an issue that we want to deal with, and damaged or diseased. But the other thing that comes into play with training and pruning is getting good uh, light to the middle of the tree. So you can see on the left is an, an unpruned peach tree, and on the right is the same tree after it's pruned. And what we're trying to look for there is what they call light channels. There's areas where the light can penetrate all the way to the middle of the tree. And one way that it's described to me is if you can envision kicking a soccer ball through the tree and it not hitting a branch, then you've got the kind of light channel that you want to get down between the branches and, and get the proper light exposure. So getting these light channels and opening it up to get sunlight to the center of the tree. Another thing that comes into play is the branch angle, not the crotch angle, but the angle of the branch itself. Uh, where a, a branch that is vertical tends to be very vegetative, meaning it produces lots of leaves and lots of shoots and no fruit. Uh, and more horizontal, they tend to be more balanced where you're getting more and more fruit production. So here's kind of a schematic of apples. You can see uh, A over here is a very vertical branch. It's got one little flowering spur. Um, and everything else is leaves, and that one fruit that's produced on the one flowering spur is going to rub on that branch all summer and not be worth anything. Whereas a horizontal branch has a mixture of um, fruiting spurs and vegetative shoots, and that's going to give you the kind of fruit production that you want. Uh, that's C, and then B is a fairly pendant branch. Now that pen being pendant, hanging down, is not a problem as long as there's light to that area, but oftentimes where the branch is very pendant, as shown in this diagram, the leaves on that shoot are not going to be very well sun exposed. <coughs> Excuse me. So branch uh, orientation or angle becomes important in getting fruit production. So there's training techniques that, that come into play to get that orientation that we want. Uh, they include using spreaders to, to increase the crotch angle as well as to position the branches. Uh, they include bending uh, and tying down to a trellis. Um, all of these have to do with positioning the limb. So as we bring the branch down, uh, we actually it affects the, the hormone distribution in the, in the branch, and it actually stimulates uh, flower bud development. So a lot of times I'll get questions from people that say, oh, I've got a young tree and it doesn't want to produce fruit and maybe I should whack it with a baseball bat. That's what I've, that's the wives tale I've heard. What, what works very well for young branches is to take the, or young trees is to take the branches um, that we want to, to start producing fruit, bend them down and leave them down so that they will initiate flower buds. And then once they produce fruit, the weight of the fruit will keep the branch down and keep it oriented appropriately. Uh, so that's just showing. If you bend it down too far, you can see here on the right, you'll get a water sprout that comes up, uh, which may or may not be a problem. Oftentimes, growers won't worry about that. They'll bend them down. And then if they get water sprouts, they just cut them out. Uh, so that the, the branch positioning becomes critical. Uh, so the types of pruning cuts that we use to, to uh, get the shape that we want, get the fruit that we want, is also a little bit different. We use heading cuts, we use thinning cuts, but we also use what's called stubbing cuts or Dutch cuts. And I'll talk about each of these. Some of these are, are going to be very familiar to you, and some might be new. I'll just talk about all three since, so that our, our terminology matches up. So a heading cut is here up on the 
uh, top left, you can see that where the little marks are made, the heading cuts were made. And just to the right of that, the resulting growth. So a heading cut is just cutting back a third or a half of the branch, and then you get this flush of growth just below that where the buds break and produce the branches. Uh, so that's a heading cut. The thinning cut is shown below where that lower of the three branches was cut off. You can see that that's just thinned it out. It was cut back to the branch collar, and it was removed. So the, the third, so, so this would be a diagram of an appropriate and an inappropriate thinning cut. So A to B would give you the, the minimum amount of, of wound cutting there just above that branch collar. C to D is going to be too big of a wound. This is pretty basic. But what the, the third one I want to talk about, which may be very new to you, and oftentimes I get arborists get on my case when I talk about this, is this Dutch cut. And what we're doing here is we're cutting and leaving the stub so that the bottom part of that stub is maybe two inches long. And, and it looks terrible, and it doesn't heal up pro appropriately, but it works very good in fruit trees uh, for what it's intended. Uh, and what that is, is when we make this kind of a cut, we remove a branch that we don't want, but we leave preformed latent buds on the lower side of that base of that branch. And those will grow out, and they will be very flat. They'll have a wide crotch angle. They'll, they'll, they tend to grow very horizontally, and they tend to set a lot of flower buds. And so we're taking off a branch that we don't want and replacing it or renewing it with the kind of branch that we do want. And this is probably one of the most common cuts that we make when we're pruning uh, fruit trees. So here's what it looks like the next year. So you can see this branch was probably coming out and, and growing fairly upright, fairly vigorous. We made that Dutch cut. We got a bud break from one of those latent uh, preformed buds that was on the lower side of the branch, and that's coming out at a nice angle, fairly flat, and that's going to produce a lot of flower buds and a lot of fruit. So that's a, a, uh, a common uh, situation that's, that's used. Okay, so, I, so I'm almost done. I see there's a couple of questions there. I'll get to those in just a second. So the purpose of each of these hey Brent, cuts, we have about five minutes. heading cut is to break apical dominance, to, to release those branches or those buds to form branches. A thinning cut is complete Great. removal of the branch. The stubbing cut is to remove the branch but allow for replacement with a, a fruiting, uh, productive, horizontal branch. Okay, so then the other thing to come into play is kind of the, the overall conformation of the tree. What are we trying to do? This is a modified leader. This is typical of what would be done with, say, a semi-dwarf apple tree for a home garden. It works very well. Uh, it works uh, also used for plums uh, with a lot of the other stone fruits. We, we can use a modified leader with cherries. But more often than not, we're using kind of this open center, this vase approach, where we're establishing a, a whirl of branches that form a vase. This is for peaches. Uh, works well for uh, peaches, nectarines, cherries. Uh, so those are that's kind of the confirmation. But either way, whether you're using this open center or the modified leader, we want that open light penetration getting to the middle of the tree. So that's kind of two different approaches. Let me go to the questions. I have one. Are the flowering pears also susceptible to fire blight? Typically, there is some fire blight resistance in, in the pear genus. And so typically, the, the flowering pears are selected to be more fire blight resistant. Unfortunately, uh, Bartlett and Bosk and all of the ones that we like to eat tend to be very, very susceptible. I haven't seen a lot of fire blight on, on the flowering pears. Maybe this is something Marion can talk more about. But my sense is that they're much, much more resistant than the, than the fruiting types. Uh, the, the next question has to do with these multi-variety uh, types. Uh, you see them in the trade industry where they'll have you can buy a, an apple tree that has four varieties on it. And what they do is they establish the tree, and then they graft each uh, scaffold branch to be a different variety. Uh, that, and and the, the question was, how do we deal with these varying growth patterns? And that is exactly the problem. 
when so so the, the the vigor of the tree is a function of the rootstock, but it's also a function of the cyan variety. And when you get them all there together, uh, it's it's a struggle to keep them in balance. You'll have one branch that wants to be very vigorous and one that wants to settle down and fruit. And when you have those on the same tree, the vigorous one starts to shade out the fruiting one. Uh, and more often than not, it it doesn't work out well for for a fairly small space uh, you might want to try and battle it and maybe my approach would be instead of having four leaders with four different varieties to keep it down to two and have each one grow in a different direction and try and deal with it that way it really is a challenge to keep them uh, in balance but that is a good question and an accurate problem that we deal with I don't know if there's any time or any more questions but uh, thanks for your attention and Hope that helped you. Great. Thanks, Brent. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of great information that um, hopefully everybody found useful. Um, so I'd like to give our presenters a big thank you for volunteering their time today. Uh, before you log off, please participate in the polls that I'll bring up in just a second. Next